Welcome to lecture 13. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce plant communities. You can think of this as an introduction to plant community ecology with an emphasis on California. Now I realize we don't all live in California, but since UC Davis is in California, I thought it might be helpful for you to understand some of the plant communities that exist in our state. One of the cool things about this week is I'm going to have a two-part series on houseplants. The first part is going to be with Marlene Simon, and she's going to teach us the basics of houseplant care. This is going to include things like watering, soil, and taking care of houseplants with pests. But then part two, we're gonna move away from the basics of plant care and give you some specific examples. This is going to involve an interview with Caden Richardson, who is a student in PLB 10 this quarter and has a hobby of making bonsai trees. And so stay tuned for lots of house plant questions and answers. Hopefully, if you uh, watch the lecture, you're gonna gain some insight and be able to have your own house plant hobby. Let's get started. Hi everyone, we're going to talk house plants. There's many reasons to grow house plants. They're beautiful, they decrease stress, and NASA even did a study that showed that house plants can cleanse your air. Some of them are super easy to grow. You just put them in a pot and they grow with no problems. Others could be a little more problematic, but I'm gonna go through all the steps from what pot to choose, potting soil, and what to do when you have pests and problems and your plants just aren't so happy. So join me as we talk house plants. Hi everyone, we are going to talk house plants. So house plants, most of them are tropical because they can't grow outside in our conditions, so people bring them on in. Other people grow succulents inside. As house plants, be careful with succulents. A lot of times inside there's not enough light. So when you see a house plant and you read the label, usually it should tell you where it should go, but in general, most house plants prefer an east or a south window. You should have at least one of those somewhere in your room, else you'll probably have to buy a supplemental light. And the good thing is, is LED lights are very cheap these days. You could even switch out your bulbs and use an LED bulb. Um, but a north window's great, an east window's great, south window, maybe put the plant further away from it during the summer because it can burn. Um, so that's in general what house plants are. They're generally tropical. So what should you plant your house plant in there? When you go shopping for pots, there's a lot of selection. Of course, ceramic pots come in all different colors and they be, can be quite pretty but expensive. Those are perfectly fine for house plants. Plastic is also okay. Just be careful though. If you're using tap water with a lot of salts in it, these salts get trapped in there. And a lot of times that's why you have that white crusting on older soil, that is the salt. And you could see here, terracotta is another great one, but you could see what I mean by the salts here. Terracotta at least allows for the salts to leach out. Um, so it's up to you, um, you know, what you wanna use, but a must is it must have drain holes. Never plant in a pot that doesn't have a drain hole. It's just going to rot. So you have your pot. Now, what type of soil? This is really important. If you happen to water a lot, most people kill their plants by overwatering. So if you happen to kill your plants and love to water, then do a very loose soil like this, like the succulent mix right here. A succulent mix means it just has pumice or red lava sand in it and it's much looser than most potting soils. Now, if you forget to water, you may wanna go with something with a little more peat moss because peat moss holds moisture. You could definitely add, buy a bag of peat moss and add it to your soil, but a good consistent potting soil is gonna go a long way. Now, you have your pot with holes. Here's a myth that we're going to bust. Rocks in the bottom of your pot. Now, people think that helps with drainage. It does not. All it does is it decreases the amount of volume of soil. So you're basically just making your pot smaller. Um, so it really doesn't do anything. So you, you, you don't want to use rocks in the bottom of your pot. Don't use anything in the bottom of the pot. Just fill it up with soil. And remember, always leave a little gap at the top of the pot. So when you water, there's a reserve there and you're just not overflowing. Uh, so speaking of water, Davis, 
Davis has horrendous tap water. Lots of boron, lots of salt, high pH. Most plants prefer a pH of, you know, seven to 6.5, more acidic. So when you do water, use bottled water, use reverse osmosis water, use deionized water, catch rainwater. So if you're in a hard water area, try to avoid it, or you could even dilute it. And when you water, make sure water flows out the bottom of the pot every time you water, because you are then sort of just releasing those salts and pulling the salts out. And you know the whole entire root ball is being saturated. You could also look for bubbles. Once the bubbles, aeration bubbles in the, the soil stop, then you know that root ball is completely saturated. Most plants in general then want to be allowed to dry out slightly. Some six inches down, they're perfectly fine. Others an inch or two. So remember all plants are different. Some plants need high humidity, lots of moisture. Others can go weeks. I mean, I push it for weeks, but you know, 10 days without watering. So that's your soil, your water, fertilizer. It's a big question. Now fertilizing, it really depends on the fertilizer that you use. I prefer this uh, powder form that I mix and I use it every time I water. So the, usually the directions will say, oh, if you only water or fertilize once a month, do it this amount. Or if you fertilize every time you water, use this amount. So look at the package, figure out what's correct for you. But there is certain numbers you know, on all fertilizer package, there's the three numbers in front, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Nitrogen is your greening nutrient, basically. So you're gonna see that in higher numbers, usually with houseplant fertilizers, because most houseplants are grown for their foliage more than their flowers. So this is a good balance right here. Don't over fertilize. This gets into the problems with certain water and over fertilizing. So when your plant ages, right? We age, imperfections show up. It's just a fact of life. When your plant, their leaves start aging, the cells start dying off and they're going to start getting brown spots. Usually that is going to be the lower leaves as the plant puts on new leaves. Nitrogen moves to new growth. So it's pulling out the nitrogen. So lower leaves can yellow. And as the leaf starts dying down, you're going to see the tips browning until the whole entire leaf browns. Some plants are notorious for getting brown tips, no matter how old the leaves are and no matter what type of water you use. A lot of times those are the marantas, the prayer plants. They're high humidity loving plants. So a lot of times they just aren't even happy inside a house. Um, so what you can do is just take a pair of scissors and just sort of trim around and voila, it's a perfect leaf now. But of course you do want to try to pick the plant for your environment. So if you you know, you keep losing them because the leaf starts shrivel, keep shriveling up, then it's probably just not a high enough humidity inside. You can get a tray, put gravel on it and keep water there. And that will at least give a little humidity to the plant um, that it's sitting on. Or you could even buy a humidifier or some people, if they have a really bright window in their bathroom, could grow one in there and if you shower every day or I guess you should shower every day <laughs> right so remember leaves are going to age but if you over fertilize use hard water the tips of the leaves are going to brown more than if you were to use bottled water and fertilize less but just some plants are notorious for it so let's talk about other problems Pests. So there's a few pests that are just completely common on houseplants. We're talking mealybugs, which are these white cottony phloem suckers. So when I say phloem sucker, it basically means they pierce into the sugar transport part of the plant, the phloem. They pull out the sugars and then they poop it out. So if your plant is sticky, that's the insect poo that is called honeydew. So that actually could lead to secondary problems of sooty mold growing on the poo and that could block photosynthesis. So you do wanna make sure that you cut the cycle of the mealybugs. And of course, if you have enough mealybugs, they're gonna pull the carbohydrates and sugars out and you're gonna lose leaves. The leaves are gonna turn yellow and then yes, the plant can die. So my go-to for mealybugs and aphids, if you have them and thrips are just basically neem oil, a safer soap, a horticultural soap, and rubbing alcohol. Now, rubbing alcohol should not be used on hairy leaves, young leaves, and it shouldn't be used more than two to three times on each individual leaf because it can desiccate, but really that's what it does. It just desiccates the insects you spray. Dilute it about 50% 
and that way you're not just spraying it completely on the plant full full strength a lot of these times these bugs you need to hit them repeatedly not just once because you're killing the adults but you need to get the eggs and you need to get the different stages of life so mealybugs are very noticeable because of the white cottony uh, thrips look on the underside you'll see these small elongated bugs and they cause almost like a silvery appearance to your leaves spider mites spider mites are another big problem if it's really bad infestation you will see small cobwebbing and when it gets really bad the cobwebs will be dripping down like a string and they're hard to tell so what you could do to tell if you have some of these pests is take a white sheet of paper put it under a leaf tap the leaf and then look what's crawling around on that white paper and that will let you know oh yeah it is a pest because a lot of people think oh my leaves are turning yellow my leaves are falling off it must be a pest not not necessarily it could be other issues like what we talked about um, so a go-to for spider mites is going to be a sulfur spray or even neem oil but the key is to doing it again and again so those are some problematic pests on your house plants now there are some diseases your plants will get powdery mildew and it's exactly what it sounds like just a white powdery coating on your leaves begonias are notorious for getting it and what you could use for that is sulfur either the dust or the spray and neem oil but remember if you spray it on a leaf it's not going to eradicate it from that leaf it's just going to prevent the spores from taking hold on the newer leaves so sometimes just even picking off the affected leaves if you have enough leaves on your plant will take care of the problem um leaf spot leaf spots another uh foliar fungus like powdery mildew and it shows up just like leaf spots these brown uh, circular marks on your leaf and rust rust isn't very common on house plants but sometimes you can see it and if you turn the leaf over it's red pustules but sulfur spray and neem are your controls for those diseases so that's really those are mostly the pests and diseases you're going to see on your plant but really the leading cause of plant death is overwatering. You're watering too much and the roots are just rotting out. So to ensure that, of course, don't overwater, dig down into the soil. Your finger is actually your best tool to decide. Dig down, know your plant, of course. Um, some, some plants can go for weeks, like the easy ZZ plant could go for months i tried one out six months didn't water it and it was fine others certain begonias or uh, uh aeroids you know they need more water um so when you're planting and you're potting up going back to the pots don't over pot your plant and what do i mean by that is you know don't go from this size pot to then a five gallon pot what happens is think of your soil as a sponge when you're wetting it it's holding on to that water if the root system isn't big enough to pick up the moisture there is wet soil sitting in there and of course that could lead to disease and problems and then rot to your your plant all right so speaking of pot size what you never want to do is take a pot say about this size and move it up too big you want to move your pots your plants up incrementally so what happens is soil acts like a sponge and when you fully wet it it's going to hold on to that moisture especially if the root ball and the roots aren't big enough to absorb the moisture so standing wet soil is the worst thing for your plants it's going to lead to root rot and pathogens and diseases and kill your plant so some plants grow super fast and you can move them into a pot and the roots are going to fill up that spot in no time at all but for most plants they're not going to do that so don't over pot just make sure the pot that you choose has a few inches on either side and it just it basically it's going to allow the roots to grow slowly and then you could keep moving it up so i'm going to go ahead and transplant and show you how to transplant so i got my pot of course with a hole slightly bigger than the existing pot and sometimes it's hard to take a plant out of a pot so generally when it's a plastic pot and all i did was spray paint this pot here so if you can't afford ceramic and you want different colors spray paint is your best friend so usually with plastic you just squeeze it right you never want to just yank it out you want to pull it from the base sometimes there's roots growing out the bottom and you could push them back in or in this case this is a plastic cheap pot so you could cut cut it away right if you don't want to cut the roots um, so basically sometimes you have to be a little brutal to the pot other times it's difficult to 
pull it out and you take a rubber mallet this is where you can hold the top of the plant and you just tap around here and it'll sort of just push the pot out like that so sometimes at the conservatory we do have to break pots just to get the root system out um, so sometimes it is necessary so here's my root ball you can see there's roots starting to circle it's getting a little root bound so this is a good time to transplant it you want to loosen the root ball and you really want to get rid of some of this this soil especially if you're going to a different type of soil that way the transition isn't as abrupt this is similar to soil to what i'm using so i'm really just going to loosen this up you could see most of the roots are at the bottom here so that's good you just want the root ball to not look like it just came out of a pot so loose some of it. You are going to break roots. That is okay. This one is circling. So sometimes when they're really circling, you want to sort of move them gently to a different direction. But here you go. So that is the root ball. I'm going to fill a little bit of soil in the bottom. Remember, no rocks in the bottom. Make sure your potting soil is slightly moist. You never want to plant into very dry soil. And right now, this is losing moisture from the air. So you never want to take it out of the pot and just then go have lunch. If you do cover it with wet soil or wet newspaper so I'm just gonna fill my pot not fill it just add a little bit place it center it and then I'm going to just I even though I have this I just use my hand for everything and back fill in and sometimes you know if you're at the right level you could just pull it up to get it at the right level so you're just gonna fill it all the way around remember you want to leave a little lip you don't want to put the soil all the way to the top because you want that water reserve so when you pour the water is just sitting in the pot and then it could percolate down so this one was pretty easy to transplant sometimes the root balls are a little funky uh, sometimes you do need to even cut some roots off but that's it and then of course after you transplant you're going to water, want to water it in right away and of course water in so all the soil is fully saturated and water comes out the bottom. Now if you have a high peat moss soil, it's very difficult to wet peat when it gets dry and if you don't pre-wet your soil and you pour water in it, it's very hydrophobic and you literally see the peat just sort of rise up and the water just basically not saturate the peat. And it looks sometimes like you've wet, but if you dig down, you have dry pockets. So that's why you want to mix and use water in your soil. You don't want sopping wet, but just moist enough that you know it's, it's already you broke that surface tension of the peat and when you water, it's going to be completely wet. So this is my plant. I'm going to put it, of course, this one, this Dracaena, takes low light or high light. So an east window would be perfect. Um, this one is notorious for getting brown tips on its leaves, but you know, that's okay. This here is probably a little bit of bacterial leaf spot. It's very common on like your uh, fiddle leaf ficus. And sometimes that's just from overwatering as well. So if you have big brown blotches, make sure you're not overwatering. But also, this is the lower leaf. And remember what I said about lower leaves, they're going to age. Think of it as gray hair and wrinkles. You guys don't know about that yet, but you will. So just you know, remember your plants aren't gonna look perfect all the time. They're, they are growing living beans, right? All right, so I'm gonna go over some of the easiest house plants to grow. These are, you can't kill them even if you tried. Okay, well, you probably could kill them even if you didn't try, but here you go, here they are. So the first one is the Syndapsis. This is in the aeroid family. It's a trailer, as you could see, or it actually even sticks to the wall without harming your wall. It likes a lot of light, low light. You could go about 10 to 12 days without watering it and it's totally happy. It grows really fast, but then you could just trim it back and take these pieces and stick them back in the pot and it'll grow more. So Syndapsis, uh, it's almost like a pothos, but with a little pizzazz because it has these uh, nice markings in sort of a velvety leaf. So pretty fast growing. Now, another one is Dracaena. There are different species of Dracaena. This one is a variegated fragrance called corn plant. Um, that's why common names are a problem because you're like, oh, I have this corn plant. And of course, think of corn. There's also Dracaena marginata. They can get tall. They could grow up until they hit your ceiling. And then what do you do then? Well, you just cut them back to any point and they'll side branch. Uh, this one is notorious for a little, having a little bit of uh, 
uh, leaf burn at the edges, but you just take a pair of scissors and trim it. Use bottled water or rainwater if you have hard water, and it could grow go a long time without water as well. Here you want to make sure that the root ball is almost completely dry before you water, and they don't mind being pot bound. So you don't have to transplant it as often. So a lot of times people want to grow house uh, succulents inside as house plants, and a lot of them just aren't happy. If you have an Escheveria or a sedum and you have it even by your sunniest window, it's still not sunny enough for a plant that wants to be outside in fuller sun. And it's gonna stretch and it's doing something called being leggy. And it basically means it's not getting a lot of light, so it's being elongated. So you can cut it back, but it's just gonna keep doing that. But the succulent that I prefer growing inside and does the best is Haworthias. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, this poor one was outside in full sun without water for months and months, and I just brought it inside and I'm gonna give it some love. But they don't grow very tall, water them every two weeks, but they handle the light inside better than most succulents. All right, another one is the Boston Fern. Uh, if you want that fern airy look, this is the fern for you. A lot of ferns aren't happy inside because it's too warm and it's too low of humidity, but the Boston fern does great. It's great hanging up and it just drapes down. When it gets too crowded, you could just divide it by taking a serrated knife, and I use a bread knife, and you could just cut the root ball into sections and then pop those up or give the other sections away. So if you are worried about it getting too big, you could just keep it in control by thinning it out and just keeping a small chunk for yourself and giving the other chunks away. Now, the easiest plant to grow is the Easy ZZ, the Zamiacolcus zamiafolia. It's another aeroid. It's grown for its really shiny green leaves. Now, the flowers on most aeroids are secondary. They're not very showy. This plant, I went six months without watering and it was in a south and an east exposure room and it was fine. I don't recommend that but it definitely errs on the side of liking to be underwater than overwatered. And yeah, so it takes low light or high light even. Um, once they get tall, you could just sort of divide them up and give out sections to your friends because they're tuberous. And one thing I wanna point out is if you have pets, like cats or dogs, and they nibble on some of these plants, do check the ASPCA website for the poisonous plants. Almost all aeroids, um, are toxic to your cat. And usually, you know, they'll chew on the leaf. It's because they have all the uh, calcium oxalates and then they'll throw up. But you don't want them to repeatedly eat it because it can lead to kidney damage. Some plants are just really bad to have. Don't even try growing a lily inside because they're very toxic to cats. But most people aren't growing lilies inside either. So there are some plants that are perfectly fine and healthy. Others, your cat, your dog can get sick if they nibble on it. So just make sure if you have um, animals and they like to chew on them, that that's something to take into consideration. So, but these are the some of the easiest house plants to grow that you can neglect a little bit, don't really need to fuss over, and they'll give you that nice lush look that you're going for. So hopefully that helped you with houseplants. Look around. The best help that you could give yourself for growing plants is figuring out where the plant is native to and helping you decide. That helps you decide what to grow. Because, you know, here I am talking about a soil-based um, houseplants. Some houseplants, like orchids, grow in orchid bark, or a lot of aeroids grow in wet sphagnum. So not everything is going to be grown the same, learn about your plant. Hopefully when you buy your plant, it has a name on it and not just a generic label that some nurseries do. Um, so learn about it, figure out where it's from, figure out the type of soil. Is it growing on a dry, rocky slope? Is it growing on the understory of the forest? All that helps you be able to grow your plant better and healthier. And remember, sometimes you just have to step away from your plant. Don't overanalyze your plant. Sometimes, you know, there's gonna be imperfections and you just have to go, okay, I know I'm doing everything right and we're gonna take it from there. So have fun with house plants, enjoy. They bring a lot of joy to your life, decrease your stress, beautify your surroundings, and of course, even cord NASA, they could cleanse the air. So hopefully that helped you grow your house plants better. 
hope that information on growing houseplants was helpful. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send me an email and I'll forward that along to Marlene so she can respond and I'll post her responses on our class Discord channel. Now, before we move on to thinking about plant communities, I wanted to clear up some confusion about some of the structures we've talked about in angiosperm life cycles, particularly the role of pollen and of course, things like seeds. So I went to the Botanical Conservatory and spoke with Ernesto Sandoval and he pulled some examples to hopefully clear some of these issues up. So let's go there and see what we can learn. There have been some questions about pollen and seeds and what's going on here. Well, so um, uh, pollen is what has moved from one flower to the other, okay? That's the whole reason why pollination exists, is, uh, or pollination with insects. You've got to move pollen, the sperm, basically, to the egg, the, 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 um, what we call the ovule inside of a, um, a flower. Um, you got to move the pollen uh, to the ovule, and that's pollination, okay? Um, so um, that's, what, that, that's, that's the whole part of pollination, the flower part, okay? And then once you get fertilization, you get a fruit forming, all right? And, and fruit diversity in and of itself is also, well, very diverse, <laughs> all right? Because um, uh, that's ge the generation of the seed. And, and I'll start off with, with this exciting one right here. I don't know if any of you guys recognize this nice bright orange fruit right here. Okay, well this fruit itself, the fruit is actually not very edible. It's the stuff inside. This is scientifically known as Theobroma cacao. Theo, God, Broma, drink. This plant makes the drink of the gods. Cacao, maybe you're getting closer now. Chocolate, we know it in English as chocolate. All right, and this fruit is from Central America and the monkeys there in uh, Central America rip these things off the, the fruits, Mexico and Guatemala and stuff, and they take them and they smash them on something. It's gonna make, gonna make a little noise here, okay? There we are, <laughs> all right? And now we've cracked open a fruit with seeds inside, all right? And there's your individual uh, chocolate uh, uh, seeds right there. In this case, these seeds are coated with this mm, material that tastes like a slimy, tart banana with a dash of lemon. The monkeys get these seeds, get them into their, into their, um, their, their mouth, um, they eat the coating off the seeds, and then if they're monkeys that haven't learned, they chew on the seeds. Ooh, bitter. <laughs> so the next time, because they're mammals, they have a brain, they learn. They take the seeds, put them in there. They eat that white pulpy stuff, and then, get rid of the seeds. <laughs> this is fun. I've never been able to do this on a tour before, but now because I'm socially distanced, you know, like I can do it. <laughs> okay, so the monkeys um, uh, fling the seeds out and that's how the seeds get spread. That's the whole purpose of fruit, the, of the carpal that develops around the seeds is to protect them as they develop before they're, you know, when they're getting fertilized and they're maturing. And then what's really cool is the fruits or parts of the fruits aid in dispersal. All right, so the seeds are inside of there after fertilization, and now you need to disperse those seeds, and you have things like lufa right here, where um, there's little cavities inside of there, and these things are really light. The, the, the wind blows them, the, the, the seeds dribble out. That's how they spread, like here we go. Yeah, a little few seeds left in there. Okay. Um, this is really cool. You, you guys recognize this one? This is the fruit, and then this is the seed that's inside of there. The world's largest single seed, the coconut, okay? Um, it's actually, can you see it's a monocot? Three, three parts, okay? Three carpels um, with one uh, seed that develops inside of there, all right? Um, one embryo that gets fertilized, and um, etc. Yeah, and so this right here, this hard layer is still part, technically part of the fruit wall. If you ever cracked open a coconut and that little papery layer just outside of the white that you eat, that is the seed coat of a coconut, okay? Um, and a coconut. And uh, what's really cool these days is they actually pre-strike them for you so that they're ready to crack. Before it was like take a hammer to it and hurt yourself and anyways, it's a more liable world out there. 
Um, so, um, and by the way, what's really cool about this fruit, this fruit does not crack open. It's a, what we call an indehiscent fruit. This fruit just, uh, um, you know, floats along in the ocean and then eventually salt water breaks this down. You get to fresh water, hopefully, and the seed, the little seedling just grows right out of one of the eyes there because there's only one that's been fertilized in coconuts. And the little, the little seedling will grow out of there. Um, and we call this indehiscent fruit. Um, in the dry fruit categories. Fleshy fruits are their own category, um, man-made. Um, but you have the ones like the loofah that actually crack open, all right? And you have other, other fruits um, real quick. So you guys might recognize this fluffy stuff. Yes, this is cotton, okay? Uh, this is the, the, the cotton, or actually hairs off the seed coat of the, uh, the cotton seed, like if I squeeze this right here and there's a seed inside of there and these seeds are hairy so that when the wind blows, the seeds get dispersed because that is part of the, that is the sort of the final function of the combination of fruit and seed is to aid in dispersal of the seeds like the coconut floating in the water. In this case, the cotton seeds blow away in the wind and this is the fruit, non-edible fruit um, that um, is made up of actually multiple carpels here, okay? So um, just to finish off, I mean, there's a lot of fruits out there. We could talk about a lot of fruits, but I want to talk about one more, which is the, the, the fruits that develop after this is, gets fer uh, pollinated, okay? So, or, you know, the, seed, the, the, the seeds get fertilized in there through the, with the pollen. So I have some fruits here, all right? And these fruits look a little like sunflower seeds, okay? And Okay, I'm a botanist. Sunflower seeds that are get cracked open are actually fruits with seeds inside. You know, you can buy, if you're like me, you, you want to be like a little bit, quote unquote, lazy. <laughs> I just buy the seeds, okay? The already uh, shucked seeds. But uh, some people like to crack them open in their mouth, and that's actually, you're cracking open a fruit with seeds inside. Well, check these out. These are so cool. These fruits sit there on the plant. They dry on the plant on that flower stalk, all right? And... Um, there you go. I wanted to end this off with a bang here. Uh, explosive dehiscence, okay? Again, showing dispersal. The seeds fly out of there. Each of these fruits had four seeds in there, and most of the seeds are gone because they flung away five, six, seven feet away from the mama plant. Thanks for watching. I realize that not all of us are from California, but what I'd like you to do is take a moment to think about California biology. Hopefully in your time at UC Davis, you'd had a chance to go outside and explore some of our wonderful natural areas. So think for a moment, what are the features in terms of climate and our biology that characterize California? Can you think of any other areas in the world that are similar? One of the amazing things about California is that unlike other parts of the world, we have a diverse assemblage of plant communities within several different biomes in a relatively small geographic area. So it's true that deserts and forests and alpine habitats occur in other parts of the world, but few places and even a few countries have all of these habitats within a relatively small geographic area. In California, you can drive within a single day from a desert habitat to an alpine habitat to a coastal area. And so, this diverse assemblage of plant communities is one of the prevailing characteristics of our state. While it's true that you can go to other parts of the world and find deserts, coastal scrub, and oak woodlands, California really is distinguished by having all of these different plant communities within a relatively small geographic area. So in order to find all these different communities, oftentimes you have to explore a relatively broad area but in California, you can go in one day from a desert environment to coastal scrub to alpine environments to chaparral. It's really amazing the breadth of biological habitat that our state provides. Let's take a moment to consider the difference between a biome and a community. In considering the previous questions, one of the things you may have realized is that California is unique in part because it occupies a wide range of latitude. This means that in our state, you can go from hot, dry environments, in fact, some of the lowest below seed level, like in 
Badwater Basin in Death Valley National Park, all the way to high alpine environments and coastal areas, each of which has distinct plant communities defined by specific climate characteristics of that region. If you do a little research on biomes, one of the things that you'll notice is that the number of biomes defined by ecologists varies. But what doesn't vary is that the biomes are typically defined by the plants that live in that region. If you think back to the previous question, one of the things that characterizes California is cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers. Similar areas in the world include places like Chile, the Mediterranean, and certain parts of Africa. Because climate is a principal defining factor of specific biomes, it's important to understand the basics of why certain climates are where they are. One component of this are the circulation patterns that result from the heating of ocean water near the equator and the rain that falls once it is cooled and condensed. Near the equator, these are referred to as Hadley cells, and they typically occur between 0 degrees and 30 degrees north and south. Similar cells occur between 30 and 60 degrees and 60 and 90 degrees, referred to as feral cells and polar cells, respectively. To add complexity to this, the Earth is oriented on a slight axis and rotates around the Sun such that during certain times of the year, part of the globe is more oriented towards the Sun than others. This is the reason why we have different seasons. Winter happens when part of the globe is oriented away from the Sun. Summer happens when one part of the globe is oriented more closely to the Sun. This orientation of the Earth, combined with the different circulation patterns in cells, is what contributes to climate and eventually the definition of certain biomes in conjunction with the plant species that occur in that area. One thing you'll notice is that temperature and precipitation have the largest influence on what plant species occur in a certain area. So if we were to plot this from low to high rainfall on the x-axis and high to low temperature on the y-axis, you can see that each plant community is defined by a specific combination of rainfall and temperature. Now that we've defined biome, let's take a moment to specifically define what we mean by plant community. A plant community is a collection of associative plants within a specific geographical area. It's usually identified by the dominant plant species in that area. So over the course of the lectures we've given so far, we've talked a lot about redwood forest. We call it redwood forest because that is the dominant plant species. But within the redwood forest community, you're going to find several other associated uh, plants that typically occur with redwoods. So in California, for example, you'll find huckleberry, whipple vine, sorrel, and sword fern. Each of these plants is usually associated with the redwood forest community, even though the redwoods are the dominant plant species that define it. Putting this all together, plant communities are determined by four major factors. The first one is climate, which we've discussed. The second is topography. This typically refers to elevation. The third are soil types, and so yet another reason why California has such a diversity of plant communities is it has a diversity of soil types. And the fourth is disturbance, both in terms of the intensity and the frequency of that disturbance, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Given that we've defined topography as elevation, I want you to think for a moment, how does topography play a role? See if you can come up with an example. Maybe not in California, that's okay, but a California example would be great here. So think, how does that elevation play a significant role in defining that plant community? Now that we've defined the difference between a biome and a community and talked a lot about California, 
Let's go into California plant communities and define some of the dominant ones. Because of California's climatological and topographical complexity, we have many different plant communities. If you look at the far left, you see a map of California and then many different plant communities all defined within our state. Again, this is partly due to the latitude that we occupy, but also due to the variance in climate that we experience. Within our state, several different plant communities stand out, but I'm going to talk about four. Those are chaparral, redwood forest, serpentine, and yellow pine forest. Before we move on, what I'd like you to do is take a moment to think about where we are in terms of the different California plant communities. So what I've done is I've faded out the plant community map in the background and overlaid a map of California counties with Yolo County, where UC Davis is, highlighted in blue. So take a moment and see if you can match up where we are with the key on the right to match up the California plant community that we belong to as defined by this map. The first plant community we'll talk about is chaparral. Chaparral is a dense, drought-tolerant plant community that occupies about 5% of our state. If you look on the far left, you can see a map of California and everything shaded in blue is chaparral. If you live in Southern California, you're probably very familiar with this kind of habitat. It includes things that are pretty low to medium growing and it's very hard to navigate unless you have a specific hiking trail to follow. Now another thing that's important about chaparral is that it is closely associated with fire. So chaparral is a community that is adapted to burning, but the frequency of this burning is what's really important to keep in mind for the health of this community. Mature chaparral naturally burns about every 30 to 50 years and many of the species that live in this habitat are adapted to this frequency. But shorter intervals can end up seriously damaging this plant community. In this slide, you can see a close-up of manzanita. Manzanita is a plant species that is adapted to burning every 30 to 50 years. In this example, you can see a recently burned section just behind the healthy living section. One interesting thing about the chaparral plant community is that because it is adapted to burn, certain plant species only appear once fire has occurred. One common example of this is the fire poppy, which is oftentimes referred to as a fire follower. Fire followers are plants that occur shortly after a section has burned. So they are an initial species that is only present once that area has burned. So you can imagine the seeds of the fire poppy stay in the seed bank for long periods of time waiting for that section to burn so they can appear, do their reproductive cycle, and then basically go back to seed and be in the seed bank. The next plant community we'll talk about are coast redwood. The first thing to keep in mind is that when people say redwood in California, it can mean two different things. It can mean giant redwood, which occurs in the eastern Sierra, and the coast redwood, which is on the west coast. Coast redwood tends to occupy an area that's known as the fog belt. Because their roots are very shallow, they can only live in areas where the fog rolls in pretty much every day and provides them with the water that they need. If you look at the map at right, one of the things you'll notice is that in the light green shade, you can see the historic range of redwoods, which went from south of Monterey all the way up into southern Oregon. So this is the historic range of redwoods before logging and development occurred. Now you can see in blue, there are several areas that are protected, but most importantly, those areas in orange, which are existing old growth groves. What that means is that these areas are areas of primary growth where there is no history of logging. And what you can see is that those are very few and far between. And in fact, most of them occur very Northwest in our state. Aside from the giant trees, 
One of the important things about redwood forests is that they're home to many different species. There's a couple of species in California which have, which have got a lot of attention. Those are the marbled murrelet and the northern spotted owl. Now, both of these species are interesting because they prefer to nest in primary growth groves. So again, that's the orange areas that are indicated on that map. The marbled murrelet in particular is a bird that spends most of its time along the ocean, but only nests in primary old growth redwood forests. Similar to chaparral habitat, redwood forests are adapted to frequent low intensity fire. The key here is that redwood forests can experience it a lot more frequently. And whenever a fire starts in a redwood forest, the primary goal is to manage that fire so it doesn't grow out of control. If you ever have the chance to walk around in an old growth grove, you'll often see fire scars. These are scars left behind where the fire burned and eventually got snuffed out. So redwood bark has a very particular feel. It's very resistant to fire and can still continue to grow even though it suffered some damage from that burning. The next community I'll mention is the yellow pine forest. Yellow pine forest is a common plant community in the eastern side of our state and it typically refers to two different species of pines. These are the Jeffrey pine and the ponderosa pine. Now these are the dominant conifers in the Sierra Nevada between 2,500 to 7,000 feet elevation and sometimes they can be kind of hard to tell apart. So one rule of thumb is that ponderosa pines have cones that are kind of prickly. So they have sharp edges. If you pick them up, they kind of poke you. But Jeffrey pine has cones that are soft. They, laugh, they lack that prickly part. So we often say, times say prickly ponderosa and gentle Jeffrey. If you look at the map on the far right, you can see that the Ponderosa and Jeffrey pine forests have really suffered in drought. And so if I click on this map, you can see a time lapse that shows the number of dead trees that occur per acre. And you can see because of California's historic drought up until recently, there are huge tracts of dead uh, pine trees in the Eastern Sierra. Now this is really important, not only because they're a threat to um, fire because if a fire starts in those areas, um, those communities that are in those areas are going to suffer greatly, but it's also a management issue because over the past 50 to 60 years, we have instituted policies of strict fire management where any time a fire starts, it's immediately put out. Now, this is a problem because many of these communities are adapted to burn. And without that burning, the forest can become overgrown. When it becomes overgrown, and then something like this happens where you have a historic drought or an infestation by a damaging pest, you end up with a perfect recipe for a huge catastrophic forest fire. The last plant community we'll talk about is serpentine. And serpentine is interesting in California because number one, it's rare, but it also has a soil composition that is toxic to most plant life. So on the far left, you can see an example of serpentine rock. And in the middle, you can see some examples of serpentine habitat. Now, on first glance, it may not look like anything special, but most plants can't live in this toxic soil environment. So what that means is that you end up with plants that live on serpentine and nowhere else. So again, this goes back to our idea of endemism because the soil restricts plant growth or is toxic to, only, uh, uh, to most species and only a few species can live in that environment. There's a great article in the Davis Enterprise that I have linked to below. Let's move on to talk about the change of plant communities over time known as succession. One general feature to note about plant communities is that they do change over time. Whether that's over the short term or the long term, the plant species that make up that community tend to change. And we tend to break it down into three general 
phases. The first phase are pioneer species. These are plants that are the first sort of migrants into a new habitat and they grow very quickly. They're oftentimes annual species. And then as the community gets a little bit more mature, we have intermediate species, which includes things that are shrubs, maybe pines and oaks. And so here you have plants that are no longer annuals, but not quite uh, the climax community when those species have been there for a long time and are reproductive, you end up with this climax community which is comprised of mature species that really remain very stable into the next disturbance. Now this is important because the uh, plants and animals that are associated with these primary successional species also tends to change. And so if we go back and think about things like endemism, usually that occurs in habitats that are climax communities. These old growth or primary growth groves, for example, where the habitat is super stable, non-changing, and you would tend to have that higher level of endemism. When you have pioneer species or maybe even some intermediate species, you're getting this mix. And sometimes that mix can include things that don't normally occur in that habitat and effectively get outcompeted once the community becomes more mature. There's two different kinds of succession. The first kind is primary succession. And this happens when new habitat is formed. One extreme example of this is like a lava flow when you get either the burning of everything that sort of was there or the creation of new land, such as in Hawaii and certain other island archipelagos. When this happens, you get those first migrants to that community, those primary successional species. And these primary successional species will eventually end up changing once that plant community becomes more mature. The other kind of succession is secondary succession. And this is when you get the disturbance of an existing habitat. A great example of that might be a forest fire in a primary growth grove. As you can imagine, the plant species that initially colonize habitats where you have primary succession versus secondary succession tend to be pretty different. In secondary succession, oftentimes, especially if the habitat is adapted to burning, you get the faster recurrence of the species that used to be the primary and dominant species in the area. So in this example, we had a, a forest fire and now growing out of those remains are species that typically would have comprised the forest to begin with. One interesting biological example, especially in habitats where the plants are adapted to frequent disturbance is serotony. Serotony is an adaptation in plants where seeds are only released when there is an environmental trigger. That trigger can be lots of different things, but the most famous one is fire. So a good example of this is lodgepole pine. If you've ever seen lodgepole pine, you can recognize it because it grows very straight and tall. Lodgepole pine cones are tightly closed and covered with a resin, and that resin is combustible. So what happens is when a fire breaks out in a lodgepole pine forest, the cones that have littered the ground for sometimes decades catch fire because they have a resin on the outside that is intended to burn, and you get this rapid fire that ultimately opens up those cones and releases those seeds. Again, this is an example of a habitat that is adapted to relatively frequent fire. But the problem is, is that in areas where you have a plant community that is adapted to frequent fire, what's happened over the past 50 or 60 years is that we have implemented in many states an aggressive policy towards putting out any forest fires that start. So in effect, what happens is we don't allow these forests to burn as they naturally should. And so what the consequence of this is that the trees end up getting really overgrown. The habitat changes such that the trees are all closely growing. And so when a fire does break out, it ends up going kind of crazy. And an example of this is Yellowstone National Park in the late 80s 
where an aggressive policy of fire suppression was implemented. And so the forest got really overgrown. Now in the late eighties, what happens is a series of smaller fires sort of quickly grew and consumed huge areas of the park. So much so that thousands of firefighters had to be brought in from across the United States to combat this massive fire in the park. So one consequence of this is that the plants and animals affected by this massive fire are really still recovering. If you look on the far left in 1988, there's a great time lapse that shows that several small fires originally started, but then very quickly, within a matter of days, it bloomed up and many of those fires ended up being connected. So that, that's one of the reasons why it got so bad. And this is partly due to the management of fires that were happening in the park at that time. One year later, you can see the consequences of all those fires. And then 21 years later in 2011, you can see that many of those areas still bear the scars of those serious fires. On a personal side, I had the chance to go and see some of this damage myself by going into the back country in Yellowstone in 2018 to a place called the Thoroughfare. So I hiked back for a couple of weeks into the very most remote parts of the park where the damage from those 88 fires still remains. Now when you're hiking along the trails, one of the things that you can see is the rem remnants of all these old dead pine trees that resulted from the burn. And then the trees that are coming up underneath are still really small because the elevation and temperature there makes the growing season very short. If you look at even a bigger distance, you can see that it almost looks like there was some kind of volcanic eruption in the area where thousands and thousands and thousands of trees are left on the ground, rotting away from that original fire. In this lecture, we focused on plant communities. As part of this lecture, we talked about climate and its impact on the definition of Earth's biomes and the relationship of biomes to plant communities. Now we did emphasize California quite a bit in this lecture, and that's because UC Davis is in California, and it's my sincere hope that you get outside and get a chance to go see some of these interesting habitats. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to set up office hours via Zoom with you. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.